Hello, everyone. I'm so glad you're here. My name is Nicole Wallach, and I want to welcome you all, wherever you are, uh, to the fourth edition of our series, Writing Inside and Outside the Academy. And for today's event, we're going to be meeting with Professor Marco Tedesco uh, to talk about stories of climate change. I just want to give us some initial notes and to provide you with a little bit of context about this series and to give you some um, ideas about how the session will go so that you know how best you can participate in what we're doing together today. So uh, first, uh, I want to let you know that we're um, recording this session so it's available uh, in the future and you can use it as you wish. Uh, and that um, if you are going to participate in the conversation at the, at the end of our session, um, those remarks also will be recorded. If you have the capacity and you wish to do so, we invite you to turn on your camera to be visible to us. In these strange times and in the context of Zoom, we know it's very tiring to be in this context, but at the same time, it's wonderful for all of us just to be together in whatever ways we can. And it's incredibly valuable to be able to see you all. Um, when we go to the question and answer component of our event, um, you'll be directing your comments, please, to our wonderful partner in this series, uh, Dean Beth Samaya from the School of Professional Studies. Thank you, Beth, who will be appearing as Beth Samaya Q&A. That's not her real last name. We're just doing that. So if you would direct your questions uh, to her and then we'll relay them uh, to Professor Dedesco as they arise and we'll get to as many as they can. So I want to tell you a little bit of context for uh, why we're holding this series. This is the 13th year that we in the undergraduate writing program at Columbia have been doing interviews with colleagues uh, who write across the disciplines um, about their research and about the work they do from their disciplines to reach myriad publics, many different kinds of audiences, the ones that we know of, the ones that we might wish to have, and those that we're trying to kind of create newly that may not even yet exist. And we think it's very important for us as writers to know that even the most accomplished among us um, have to face moments of indecision or have hard problems to solve intellectually, formally, um, sometimes even politically when we think about how we create homes for our work. And so this series is in part to do some demystifying of that process and that work, and also to uh, remind us that wherever we are in our writing lives and our developing expertise, uh, we are accompanied by myriad others, uh, including our guests for, for these week's series. So without further discussion of that, um, we'll move into our event uh, for today. And I'd like to introduce to you our colleague, Marco Tedesco. Marco Tedesco is a Lamont research professor at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University and adjunct scientist at NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. He received his laureate degree and PhD in Italy from the University of Naples and the Italian National Research Council. He then spent five years as a postdoc and research scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. He moved to CCNY in 2008 as assistant professor. And during his time at CCNY, he founded and directed the Cryosphere Processes Laboratory and was a rotating program manager at the National Science Foundation between 2013 and 15. In January 2016, we were delighted to have him join Columbia University. Dr. Didesco's research focuses on the dynamics of seasonal snowpack, ice sheet surface properties, high latitude field work, global climate change and its implications on the economy and real estate. And I am just so delighted to welcome him tonight as our guest. So welcome to you, Marco. I'm so glad to have you with us. 
Thank you, Nicole. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me. So um, there, we have much ground to cover, and and uh, not too uh, not too much time. But I, I wanted to begin with us being able to talk about. Um, your life as a writer, maybe before you became the author of many articles and books and interviews. And uh, just tell us, how is it that someone who does work in climate science uh, started writing? Where, where and when did you start ident self-identifying as someone who writes? Uh, so Nicole, thanks so much. I'm very you know, humbly ashamed also to you know, be called a writer with this audience because I, I don't have formal training. As, as an engineer, I, I believe in methods, even though I don't apply that to my everyday life. <clears throat> I believe in chaos uh, and uh, uh, applied carefully, I think chaos can be very helpful. Um, uh, and also, I'm very happy to see colleagues from CCNY joining. Sorry, uh, I, I see somebody. Oh. Um, so it, it's very good to, I had a fantastic experience there. Um, the um, everything started, um, and I I had this need when I came to the United States about twenty years ago. I had to learn how to speak properly English in the sense of conversationally and listen. My then wife, um, not because she passed away, because we are not married anymore, uh, mm -hmm. was Brazilian. So I learned also Portuguese. So in my head, I had this melting pot of languages, and I do love languages. And I always loved the idea of understanding the etymology of a word to properly apply it to everyday life because words are powerful and they leave marks on emotions, on physical and everything else. So, um, and so I decided that I, my brain was wired to learn different languages. And about five to seven years ago, um, five years ago, I started to feel the need to go back to my Italian roots. The reason is um, I realized that my brain at this point was not uh, looking anymore for the depth of understanding for learning the languages of English and Portuguese. I think I, I reached a, a threshold point temporarily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I was feeling almost dry in the way I was thinking about things. Uh, I couldn't use the proper terms and uh, I was always reducing uh, or uh, infantilizing words, so to say, uh, because I could not no, and I was not um, proficient in the, in the terminology in other terms. So I decided to start writing in Italian. Uh, the other reason, of course, being an Italian, I wanted to make my mother happy to understand what I'm doing after 20 years because she doesn't speak English. I come from South Italy. Uh, English is not- It's a good reason. That's a very good reason. Uh, and so I, um, I started to look around and I wanted to actually enroll myself into the Columbia program for writing and then, um, I, I asked somebody who gave me the answer, which I usually give, but I didn't want to listen to myself. And I said, how do I just write better? How do I do? And somebody told me, just do it. Uh, and so I bought a book that told, was like, write 500 things you want to write about. It was mm -hmm. providing me themes and everything else. So for example, what, write something about what a chair. And I started to write what a chair will feel if somebody sit on it. What is the sensation of the person arriving? So I, just, I decided I had this world and I've been always a creative person, as you can see from my background. I yes. play, I record, I like photography. Um, photography, are, my photos are in the book and the editor yes. was kind enough to keep them. Um, and so I started to write and I sent one piece about Greenland to an Italian newspaper, La Repubblica, um, and I had no expectations. Um, and a couple of weeks later, I checked uh, with this colleague and a person I knew there, and they said, no, no, we really liked it. And uh, we just had to make tweak it. It's coming out in three days. Uh, and they, they're running as a half page, full page, central cover uh, for the piece about Greenland and, and so on. Uh, then they started to have uh, a more regular pieces and they have a new inset on science. And they asked me if I was interested in running um, a, to, to publish um, a weekly column. And so starting January 2019, I've been submitting uh, every week one piece. It's not a big thing. It's about um, three quarter of a page uh, mm -hmm. or, or a page and a half, depending on the format, every week on different teams. Uh, and I have this uh, column called Earth, exclamation mark, in which I deal with themes about this. And from there, I realized that to 
um, I, I looked at different places, different topics, and then I uh, was approached by the original publisher in, in Italy, uh, in Saggiatore, who said, we really like your style, we do you want to write a book? Uh, I approached Alberto, the co-author. Can I just say one, yeah, one sure. second? You're sure. telling the fantasy story of every writer I know, okay? Just, just marking that as like a fact. Okay, I, please continue. I'm happy and sorry for that. Yeah, well, um, me too. <laughs> because, because these things can happen, but I'm sorry it happened not to a writer. But <laughs> Oh, it did happen to a writer, clearly. But, but, uh, but go ahead, I'm just kidding. Yeah. And so Alberto is this friend who is uh, Alberto Flores d'Arca, is a very famous Italian journalist. He's now teaching in the School of Journalism in Rome at Lewis. And uh, he's a friend. And I say, Alberto, they asked me for this. I'm going to do it only if this book becomes uh, a materialization of our friendship. And uh, I'm happy to put together a story. I had the storyline in my head, uh, the structure, everything. But I told me, I want you to contribute at least a quarter of the time because I wanted to give you the journalistic cut and add some stuff. And I want your name on the book. And so this is how the book started. Um, I um, then, since then, I realized that um, I wanted to improve my English style, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. And it did help me, I think, what really made the difference for me was the speed writing that I had to do for the Italian newspaper for the past two years, because not only I had to suggest topics and I didn't have access to uh, news before they come out. So I had to pick up a news that was already out there and make it interesting. Uh, and at the same time also, it forced me to work on something that I really do love. Uh, I think it's my engineering background, which is refining from a methodological point of view what you already have. You have something that you, you put it together, uh, then you just smooth it. And then what I like to do is once it's over, I like to step away and I like to deconstruct everything and see if I would do it again in the same way. Well, uh, I want to talk about more, more in depth about this in just a second. Yeah. But I, I want to ask you two questions, if I could, before we move on. First, um, so as a, as, a, as a, it sounds like all of this is relatively recent, right? All of this has been relatively new in your life. So what was prior to this time as a scientist and a researcher, what was writing for, for you? What role did it play for you? Yeah, and uh, to connect again to my immigrant story, um, I, when I came to the United States, I didn't have a car. I was commuting in DC an hour and 25 minutes one way. Uh, my then wife was pregnant of our first kid who turned 16 yesterday. Oh, uh, happy birthday. And, uh, and uh, I was reading uh, basically three papers one way and three papers going back, technical papers. But my goal was not really just to learn the content. Uh, that you can always go find it somewhere and if you take note. To me, what I was doing was really reading the structure, how they put together, what kind of words they use, uh, how this paper uh, would be structured one result versus another. So I was really dissecting things. And I think at that point, it did help me a lot to, um, to, uh, to develop tools that now allow me to uh, have a better infrastructure in my head to see the product. So to see, all the, to see mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, what I want to create, uh, and then work on, uh, on that. Uh, but that aspect was very important. I never felt I was dry. I was so excited about the science and the discoveries. Mm -hmm. It was a very exciting time to me. In that, put it this way, in that moment, the content of what I was doing was more important than the, the style. Mm -hmm. and, and what was driving me uh, was that this, put it, if I were an artist, it would be the discovery of new materials. I was experimenting and trying to produce with new materials and the materials were more interesting than the shape that I was going to make. So can I ask, uh, because we have folks who are in our, in our room with us today who are in different stages of learning many genres, right? And working across different disciplines. So as a, as a writer of scientific technical papers, I assume, research papers, what was one thing for you that was um, not easy to learn a specific thing about writing those papers that was not easy to learn, especially working across languages. So uh, trying to write these pieces in English in particular, perhaps. Um, what, what was something like uh, the smaller, the better in a way, because I think sometimes we think, oh, you read a lot of the papers, you just follow the formula and that's it. Right, but our experience I, is not like that, so. I, I think to me, the, the hardest part is 
to humanize the context and the content. Uh, how do, the, the question I have also when I write something, why would I read that piece? What drives me? And, and to me, of course, the most important thing, well, as we know, is the story, right? You need to have a storytelling, which a lot of technical papers, they do not have, or they have it because of the rigid form of structure uh, and it's repeat itself. So there's really no also incentive in discovering a, a, a good piece because you already know how it goes. You're just looking for the information you need. It becomes mm. a dry process. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I think what, um, uh, just being vulnerable and being open to your uh, to what you think is your opinion and putting it down there, uh, it is uh, it is it stands on the opposite side of what we are taught to do as a young uh, scientist. I say, do not write anything that you cannot prove, and you cannot prove, and if you cannot prove it, cite someone else who could have who was proving that. And so at the beginning, just even the same things that I could not prove or feeling, uh, putting down those feelings, I was like, mm, this is something that on one side is so terrible for me because it's so uncomfortable, but it was so exciting for me to enjoy the freedom that then it, it came by itself. So that I think is very important. It is Humanizing important. the story is very important for me. That's really important. I'm glad. Um, and also, I just want to remind folks uh, in the audience, if you uh, are wanting or if this part of the conversation is raising questions for you, by all means, send them to Beth so that we have them. Um, I want to just to, to make a switch at this point and, and first look, get a, a closer look at, at uh, what we call in writing studies, the scene of writing. That is one of the places where your writing gets done and ask you a little bit about your process. And then to look at how you composed a few specific pieces before we get to hear you uh, read some from, from your book. Um, so we're gonna just take a look at that. Why don't you tell us while I'm getting this ready, sure. um, something about your writing process. So when you're getting a, a writing piece done, how do you do it? How, how many days do you take? I, what do you write every day? Do you always write in the same place? Do you use the same materials? I am a very sloppy uh, writer, collector notes and uh, and I have, a, um, I have a very active metabolism. Uh, and Nicole asked me to speak slower. I can speak probably three times faster <laughs> than this. Um, so what happens, I do not even have the time sometimes to uh, take notes. What, it, what happens with, the, uh, with some of the pieces I write, I try to imagine the piece in my head. I have to see it. I have to see it, where does it start? Where does it end? what is one or two of the main messages from a scientific point of view that I want to convey, how do I convey that message without being too crazy and putting out there too much? Because of course we have the tendency as a scientist to try to teach, so to say, or say too much. And then I start to imagine what are the human aspects? What are the, the why people would be interested in that? And I call this in my head, I see the two moments is the wow moment and the aha moment. And it's uh, the wow moment is basically when people say, ah, wow, I didn't know that. And the aha moment is when that consolidates into your head because uh, aha, that's why it's like that. And I think in this way, you do create knowledge. Uh, it's not just giving them numbers. And association of information to emotions, of course, is a very powerful driver for people to absorb the information. Um, and so my process is mostly inter internal. I, I do think a lot. I, I, I keep notes in my head and I consolidate this, I would say probably 20% of the story, which is very important at the face. It's for me, it's almost like picking up the right material and starting to draft the right initial shape. But then I mostly let myself go in the next phase in which I basically fill the holes then I let it sit for a little bit. I go back. I still see if it makes sense from a storytelling point of view. And only then, after that, I look at the style and I try to match the style uh, of the piece that I want to do with my content. And uh, that's 
you know, that's the kind of work I, uh, that's the way I would do it. And yeah, you're sure. It sounds like a very recursive process. It sounds like it, it, it is something where you're revisiting material over and over again. I do enjoy that process because also, again, uh, when I was, and now I'm writing for the Italian newspaper, I can write the same story in 4,000 words or in 2,000 words, and I need to fit it in whatever they, they ask me to. And so that becomes a little bit like Ramon Kino exercise. You know, you can write the same story in 100 times and, uh, and it's still the story, but you still have 100 times. And that is a fascinating, very um, intriguing process for me because it involves the emotional, uh, rational, and, and also physical uh, landscapes. That seems so important. So well, I've just put on the screen, I hope we're all looking at it, um, a piece uh, that you wrote for Scientific American. Um, this is the, the, the cover uh, page here of the Searching for Life on Mars through the lens of Greenland. And, and so over the next few slides here, as we're looking at this, can you talk a little bit about um, both uh, sure. how you decided to write this piece and also a specific challenge that you sort of met that you had to overcome as you got it written. And, yeah. and we'll just speak briefly of each of these. Sure, sure. this piece uh, uh, stems from a project we got funded by NASA. And uh, to give a 30 seconds context, uh, what you see there, there are those called cryoconite holes. Cryoconite comes from cryo cold conite stone, which basically means cold stone. And it forms on the ice uh, as, uh, as the particles, black particles, suit, um, uh, dust and so on, they coalesce together and they sink into the ice. Uh, what we found out is that these part, these systems, the ecosystems, they do, uh, they are the only place where life thrives on the ice. Uh, now, polar bears are along the coast, but really in the interior, there is no life, not even migratory birds, because there's no food. Mm -hmm. And so uh, these holes actually are home for. Uh, um, uh, as we will see also in the next piece, uh, are home uh, to uh, bacteria and other little animals, tardigrades, uh, water bears, uh, algae, and uh, or algae, depending if you're British or American. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that uh, is also the closest thing, we think, of systems that could develop on icy planets like Mars and other uh, Galileo and other uh, small moons. So the project was to use data we collected in Greenland to look for life on Mars using remote sensing data from satellites around Mars. And, uh, and I, again, I had this wow moment. I was like, wow, we can really look at Mars in Greenland. And mm -hmm. then I say, how do we do it with the remote sensing? Aha. And so I wanted to translate this. And I thought that people need to know that what we do, this was also after Trump was elected two years after, and uh, climate scientists, we were trying also to push the fact that we study our planet. It's important also for uh, understanding outer space. And mm -hmm. I was trying to also give some room and break some social uh, discussion about uh, climate change is important, not only for our planet, but also for other things because there was so much emphasis on uh, other studies. And so yeah. the difficulty was really, I think, to try to put together the how how do you connect the climate change Greenland to Mars without making people too confused? Mm. Uh, and so the, the topic was really the life. life. Uh, remember, we'll study climate change. As we study climate change, we'll learn more about life in Greenland. And this is going to teach us about life outside our planet. So um, it's interesting when you think about uh, writing that piece, um, was there a particular part of writing it that was challenging, that was specifically challenging? I um, hear like making the relationship was really key for you. Um, right. well, as the writer of the piece, um, what were there any parts you felt like, oh, well, given the amount of space I have, I, I'm right. going to have to leave important things out, or given the public I'm trying to reach, I'm going to have to reframe things? I think the hardest part was to separate from a technical point of view how what we do in Greenland is different and applicable to Mars. And mm -hmm. I tried to simplify that a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't need to explain to people, oh, we collect this data and it's blah, blah. So I told them we collect this data and I had to simplify a lot. And this is something that I face every time I write a sentence. Mm -hmm. How much do I want to simplify? How much do I want to, compro do I want to compromise uh, between the scientific rigor uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the, um, and the 
writing um, creative process. Mm. Um, and uh, I usually tend to compromise a lot. Uh, reason is, as a scientist, I believe that my work is robust. My career is, has been you know, confirmed by colleagues after 20 years. I don't feel I have to show anymore that I have those skills. And so I take the liberty to even make some you know, mistakes, so to say, in, in simplifying things. But to me, the important thing is people need to grasp the concept that one or two points, take them home. It's more important than for me putting some numbers and show that I am good in what I okay. do rather than teaching to people. That seems important. So if we think about like this picture really is, is uh, it stops you in your tracks kind of thing when you see it. Um, and uh, these are very tiny, tiny organisms, right? Uh, so to see it so large, it's quite overwhelming. But so can you talk about the relationship between, um, this is very recent, right? Um, uh, what, what gave you the charge to, to write this piece? And did it have any, aside from like simplifying and make sure it was, uh, making sure it was simple enough, are there other, any other challenges that this piece raised for you uh, as the writer? Uh, well, this piece, uh, uh, I mean, it, it was also, um, a, it's a companion piece of, uh, of the chapter for the book and then the Guardian mm -hmm. was kind enough to, to run it also. Uh, but I, I think in, this, in these circumstances, um, again, the hardest part in this case is stay focused on the message that I want to deliver. Um, and I, I, it, this has to do a lot with me for my personality. I, again, I'm a very... Uh, creative, eclectic, expensive, uh, multitasking person. And so I, I have to really keep my mind in on, my, on my head, what is the railroad? What, what is the path that I saw in my, in my head? Um, I think in this case also, the, the, the issue is, it becomes when I finished this piece was why, how do I then, and what I think I feel like I missed, how do I make the connection to Greenland and this life and, uh, and the Arctic to everyday's life for people? Mm -hmm. uh, this is something important, something that we try to do, I try to do, doesn't always happen. And in this case, I decided to let it out because I thought it was making the piece weaker. Um, mm -hmm. But um, again, I, I, in, in this case, I think connecting with everyday's life uh, it, it was probably the, the most difficult thing I tried to do and I, and I failed uh, because I wasn't able to stick it in, even though I'm happy about the piece and uh, mm -hmm. um, I, I wish I could have done a, uh, find a way. I'm sure you will find a way because writing life is long. So, so talk to us briefly about this and then we'll get to hear you sure. read from one of your pieces. Sure. So this piece came out uh, Couple of weeks ago, also uh, on the um, or maybe three, oh my God, uh, mm -hmm. on the broadcast and uh, of Pioneer Works here in Brooklyn, and uh, um, so I call it the hidden light of ice, and um, it basically shows and tells us how things that we do not see and that we cannot uh, see around us are really driving also a lot of things that impact us. Um, the the concept here also. The, the reason why I started, and the, the core of this piece is very personal. Uh, I, I know I went through a personal experience, which was not big, uh, but a, in which there was some uh, micro uh, emotional violence. Uh, and uh, um, and, and I, I thought about how, and of course we know, how this violence can be invisible. Um, think about politics, think about elections, think about tweeting, think about all these uh, issues that we see every day. Um, and these are basically invisible to our eyes. I'm working with uh, another colleague to, the, to write a manifesto for uh, a museum of climate smells, because we have no record of smells. And when things disappear, they will be gone forever. And mm -hmm. so I thought like, oh, smells, we can see them as well. But smell is like dominating sense but we pushed for sight and audio in our society because of the uh, social media and all the visual audio visual material that we're bombed on and so i say i want to write something that shows how powerful things that we don't see are and i want to 
connected to Greenland. And, and the idea here is, look, the things that we cannot see, CO2, it's an invisible gas. Um, the bi macro violence that we perpetrate on the planet, uh, the acidification of the oceans, they are all things that we do not see. Nobody's gonna send you a picture of, of CO2 getting darker and darker and the sky is getting darker because we got more CO2. If we could have that, then it would be much more powerful. But we need to educate, I might feel as a scientist and as a communicator, people to realize and go beyond what they are told. And uh, of course, it's like Don Quixote fighting the windmills, right? You know, I, I can save one and another 10,000 will still looking at their tweet, but I, I wanted to try to, uh, you know, to push in this direction. Um, and of course, it, there's all the emotional landscape parallel that you can think about in all the things, but this was a driver um, for, for this piece. So let's, let's think about where uh, this material both comes from and goes to, right? Which is the book itself, The Hidden Life of Ice. And um, it sounds one of the, the strategies that you use over and over again in your work is to locate us in a moment, like really situate your reader in a narrative moment. Um, can you just, even before you read to us a little bit, why is that such an important gesture for you as a writer of this work? I guess because uh, the way I conceived the book was, was to include uh, all the emotional, physical, and geographical landscape. Um, but at the same time, I want the reader to, I, I was thinking actually, I was listening to a Mary Oliver's interview yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she was uh, talking about how she decided to use that I, I, I uh, in, her, in her poetry when everybody was telling you not to do it because everybody was thinking that if you use I, it becomes subjective for you, people will feel excluded. And she thought the opposite. So if I use I, the reader will read the I and they will get into the, the mood. And I think that's what I wanted to achieve. I mean, mm -hmm. I wanted people to feel and put themselves into the moment to feel the breeze of the cold air cooling my hand, uh, the me having trouble getting dressed on in the tent because you know I, I don't like it to be honest, you know, to crawl and get dressed is very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Right. And at the same time, I wanted the people to basically embed themselves and in, in themselves into the circumstances. The more they read, the more they become the character. And, and this is why I try to um, to do in their way. Plus, of course, uh, I want people to become aware of what we do in the field. And a lot mm -hmm. of questions, especially from kids, how do you go to the bathroom? How do you take showers? How do you <laughs> eat? And so, all, right. and that's all legitimate questions. Yeah. These are the wow, wow, questions, right? Uh, yeah. and, and that's why I approach it this way. Um, and I'm happy because I, um, it was also a, a choice to expose myself, to make myself vulnerable. I remember when I sat down and I started to write, I told myself, this is something that you have to expose yourself to, uh, it's something you have to be vulnerable to, and it's gonna be sometimes a painful process uh, mm -hmm. because you're gonna write about things that are close to your emotions and maybe you never explore them this way. Um, so speaking of that, let's hear some, please. Sure. So would you give us just a few pages um, yeah. and, and then we'll use that as a segue to uh, launch our conversation with our audience members. Sure, so I'm gonna read something from uh, um, a chapter uh, chapter four called Forgotten Heroes. And I dedicated, I, this chapter focuses on uh, um, those who have been doing a lot of exploration in the Arctic, but have been forgotten, namely uh, African-American explorers and uh, women. Uh, I, I really cared about having this chapter in the book, given also the times and given also the past as a, as a white privileged man in my career uh, on, and, and what all is happening and all the things that I'm learning from a social perspective and, uh, and, and so on. And so this part is dedicated and I had to also be very careful. I wanted to challenge myself because I'm not an African-American, I'm not a woman, but I also wanted to do it respectfully. And, uh, and this was a very, um, um, you know, uh, constructive process for me. But I'm gonna read something that has to do with the women. Uh, one thing that shocked me a lot was the realization, I knew of course that Antarctica in the past was always seen as this woman to be conquered and everything was male oriented, everything was patriarchal, you know, and, and women were just accompanying men who were doing discovery. So I wanted to highlight things 
about women so that people could use this and say, hey, look, it's not just about men. This is what I, what I, I learned. And so I'm going to read you uh, two pages and uh, Perfect. that um, are talking about this. And it's, it could be relatively dry, but um, I, I think it's, uh, it's uh, appropriate. So the first woman in the modern era to set foot on Antarctica was Carolyn Nicholson in 1935, or so the world has always thought. Born in Denmark, Carolyn later moved to Norway when she married Captain Clarius Nicholson, whom she accompanied on a resupply mission he was leading to Antarctica. It wasn't clear at the time if Carolyn had actually landed on the Antarctic mainland or an island. It was only early in the new millennium after her death in 1998 the researchers published articles concluding that she had not, in fact, reached the mainland. She had actually landed on an island a few miles from the coast. I can only imagine how frustrated she would have been if she had known how close she had gotten to a missing the target by such a tiny distance. Let's look at the numbers. The distance between Antarctica and Europe is on the order of some 6,000 miles, about 10,000 kilometers. The three miles the five kilometers that Caroline missed the mainland continent is equal to 0.033% of the total distance she traveled between Europe and Antarctica. Missing the target by three miles is a little like saving for years and years to pay for a thousand dollars holiday and having it fall through because you're just off of 33 cents. Nevertheless, it resulted in the title of first woman to set foot on the Antarctic mainland being conferred upon Ingrid Christensen instead. The Norwegian daughter of one of the most successful whaling magnates of the period, Ingrid was a role model and a natural leader for women at her time. She was fearless, charismatic, and incredibly independent. I don't think we hear about these things very uh, about explorers, you know. In 36 and 37, Ingrid made her fourth and final trip south, accompanied by three other women, one of whom was her daughter Augusta Sophie Christensen. Ingrid flew over the mainland, becoming the first woman to see Antarctica from the air. On January 30th, 1937, Lars Christensen, Ingrid's husband, recorded in his diary that his wife landed at Scowling Monolith, a crescent-shaped rock fronting the Antarctic Ocean, becoming the first woman to set foot on the Antarctic mainland. And now I'm going back to the scene. The others have pulled closer to us and Ian heads over to them. I remain to one side preferring to be alone a bit longer. It helps me to focus on my thoughts on the tasks I have. I go over in my head all the things not to do, the mistakes not to make, the little things that could ruin everything. Then my mind drifts back to women in Antarctica and my daughters, and the many times I've dreamed of sharing these emotions and experiences with them, now and in the future. Even though they're still young, I imagine myself chatting with them right here in this exact spot. And then I have basically a letter to the daughters, which I'm going to leave for you to read, uh, in which I basically uh, try to uh, communicate with them my position about uh, what I think the life for a woman could be. And uh, that was also a very interesting thing. So um, I also would like to offer a few copies of the book. If people are interested, send me an email. I have extra copies and I can ship them for you for free if you if, you're, uh, if you want them, and uh, uh, Colombia has agreed to, you know, to help me in this regard. So I'm more than happy to spend Colombia money in this way. Oh boy. Okay, I think we'll, we'll get takers for that right away. Thank you so much for reading that. Can you tell me um, two things I, I wanna ask before, before we open up the two other things? Um, well, actually three things. Uh, how, how long did it take for you to craft that scene? Um, how many revisions do you think it took for you to get that balance between the historiography, historical work that you were doing, the um, scene setting work that you were doing, the reflective work you were doing? How long do you feel like it probably took you to write that? For the old book? No, actually just that part you read us even, that part, potentially. That part, I would say probably I went through it about four revisions uh, myself and Alberto went through it twice. Twice, yeah. I'll and, what, twice and, and for myself. So how did you go about doing the historical work that you needed? Well, um, I started from uh, the idea of the chapters being 12 hours. So I gave myself a rigid timeline for the day. And, and so in which I boxed in the different activities 
of the mm -hmm. framework. So I check the box of the technical aspect. Then I try to match the different activities with the topics for climate so that the reader should not be distracted and say, oh, I need to think about something completely different of what they're measuring. So to keep things consistent. And then only, and so I had a, a storyline, a timeline fixed in my head about the, the field work dates that will then uh, cascade down to mm -hmm. uh, the different topics on the climate side. And then I decided to fill that with my emotional landscape because at that point I didn't have to pay any more attention to the technical side. My mind was free to, to, to go through my emotional landscape. I didn't have to be worried to say things I was afraid of. I could write, oh, I was crying as I, as I wrote in the book because I felt alone or I was sorry, I was the happiest man on earth. And so I could just be fill in without thinking. And then I had to basically uh, put everything together in a, in a more balanced way. Uh, that's why I needed to go through, you know, several revisions. Yes. But um, honest, I, it took me in total eight months to write the entire book. It took eight months. Yeah. And and that sounds fast to me. I mean, yeah, I, I used to basically go to um, to rent a place on the Catskills on Thursday, spend the weekends, wake up at five o'clock, ride between five and noon, one o'clock, and with some morning glasses of wine uh to help my yeah i mean not required what, everyone absolutely not required maybe no rare. but you know I, we are not the <laughs> here i think but uh, um, yeah, yeah. but at uh, that uh, and, and then after that i was basically stopping working and uh relaxing in the woods and uh, wait for uh some of the emotional energy to come back wow so it was really a replenishing sitting with and it sounds like also just dedicating very particular kinds of time, which it, itself, as we know, is a privilege. It was right, almost to, it was almost free uh, free therapy sessions. Ah, see <laughs> that too. Um, thank you for that. Um, one last thing for me, I can I can hear in what you're trying to do in this book that that you have a vision for what science writing can and should be. Um, can you say a little bit about other science writers? who, or just writers, who have been very influential for you and where, what kind of influence you would like to see your own work doing for, for the, our next generations of right. scientists? I, I don't, um, from a science writers, I, I try, I, I don't, maybe, maybe I can think about a couple of RT books. Um, uh, I, I, now the name of it escapes me of the author, but uh, I love um, Mary Oliver, as I as I was mentioning, and I love the fact that she can you know, merge nature and poetry in, in such a beautiful way. I'm planning to visit her home in, in Massachusetts soon to see where she lives. Uh, I I love Rebecca Solnit, um, and uh, all this, and I, I also also liked you know all the uh, Middle Eastern uh, Oriental culture that put nature in the center and harmony, the Japanese culture. So I do not have really uh, a preferred author, but uh, I like very powerful and uh, poetic um, voices like, again, Mary Oliver, Rebecca Solny, and, uh, and strongly opinionated people are very important for me. Why? Because I am a shy writer. And despite uh, what I, before, putting that out, uh, I need to go through uh, different layers of my skin. And uh, mm. I, I'm learning more and more to become more direct uh, because I want that power to be transmitted more. But uh, again, it depends also on where you're writing. I think for this mm. kind of book, it was, it was OK to be milder. Uh, and of course, the more I write, and depending on how things will go so on Tuesday, we'll have to see what kind of tone we have to set on our, our science pieces uh, because of the social and political uh, you know, consequences of elections. So we'll see what, what happens. Yes, uh, we, we do. And um, in my field of writing studies, we often talk about what is the rhetorical situation. Yeah. And our rhetorical situation is deeply inflected by other factors in our lives, of course. I know you want to open for questions. I just want I to do. mention one thing. and. I, I believe, I think there should be some, I hope there will be uh, some, sort of, some sort of opening culturally between the writing and the science world. And in which I, I do, there are more writers that I work with, that work with me as a scientist than scientists who I can talk to about my activities uh, outside the, the, the science scientific work. 
And, and I think there is a lot of barrier uh, in this regard because scientists, they think they have everything figured out, they were very important, they were, we have to be rich and so on. So I, I hope there will be more and more uh, communication channels that try to expose um, the feeling you can have when you ride. And it's, you know, after a while, that uncomfortable feeling becomes your friend because that's really what drives your creative process, at least for me. That seems so important to emphasize. Um, and also to sort of say whose voices would we like to hear that we aren't hearing enough from and across. So thank you so much for, for our conversation so far. I wanna now bring in um, folks from the audience. And I just wanna encourage if you, you have not yet posted a question for us that you would like to this and if it doesn't have to be a question it could be a comment too and so uh perhaps we can uh invite people to do that and we'll we'll get started with one of the questions i'm going to invite someone to to speak to us and um and then we'll just keep working with the with the new questions as they arise um I wonder if Caleb Bra uh, Bowen is still with us. Caleb, would you ask your question, please? Uh, yeah. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I was uh, curious. You said that uh, you didn't think cows were uh, an issue uh, in terms of uh, climate change. Uh, I, I, di I didn't hear you elaborate on that. Uh, that's question one. And question two, if you could pick one, whether it be um, educational, like you're doing, writing books, or um, whether it be uh, more technical, like with uh, help, like helping uh, businesses create a better uh, model for uh, econo not economic but um, sustainability and things of that nature, like technology-wise, which one uh, should students focus more on? Does that make sense? Yeah, well, I, I, I'll ask you if I understand properly. But um, so the first question is, I, I do, I, I'm not sure if I say something like that in the book, I, I probably wrong. Um, but cows are a, um, a problem in the sense that, of course, methane generated by cows, either through, let's say, flatulences or uh, burps, uh, it's, uh, it's a big issue. Uh, methane is... Uh, 80 times more powerful than CO2, even though it stays less uh, longer in the atmosphere. It doesn't stay as long as uh, CO2, but it has a much stronger greenhouse power. So cows, actually, I, I was vegetarian between 25 and 35, and I became vegetarian again a year ago um, just because of this, um, trying to you know, um, reduce the consumption of meat be because of uh, I think given leading by example, so sometimes I can do everything, but it's, it's a good thing. Um, if I, uh, I, my understanding for the second question is, uh, if I had to decide what to do, if I write a book for educational purposes or write a, or, or help businesses to figure out impacts of climate change on economics, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, uh, if I really had to decide, I guess it depends on, uh, um, oh, I, well, I can tell you what I did, uh, and correct me if the question is wrong, uh, but what I did, I wrote the book, and then I started a, a small consulting company in January after I finished the book, in, with which I, I do some consulting for economic impacts with companies, or I do my work at Columbia um, uh, about the economic impacts on real estate. Um, I do think, though, that in my day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week thinking, I do have space for both. Um, the reason is also, I don't want to show up because I, I, I have a lot of time being a, a, a man who lives alone without my family and daughters. I basically wake up for, uh, I don't know why reasons at 5.30 every morning, depending on what time I go to bed. And, uh, and so I have a time to kill during the day. And uh, I consider also writing a, and a great intellectual pleasure that I, I switch from a hobby to a, a job, so to say. So when I get off from a technical aspect, I go read. I can take a note and write a couple of pages. I don't feel it as, a, as, a, as an issue for me. I hope it answers your question, Kelly. Thank yes, you it does. For that Thank question. you so much. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now, uh, again, more uh, on, on the question of writing. Um, Thomas Peel, would you ask your question, please? Thomas, if you're still here with us, would you ask this question? 
Yes, I'm here. Thank, Thank you. you. I stepped away to play with my cat, but I was oh well. The whole time. Oh, good. <laughs> she's she's very. Uh, you get extra points if we get to see the cat. Okay, yeah. I'll see if I can control her. <laughs> um, <laughs> So thank you, Marco, for your talk. Um, you said something at the end. I'm the I'm at CCNI. What CCNI? So thanks for your your shout out to us. Um, and I direct the writing across the curriculum program. And one of the my, one of the things I'm really interested in is talking to scientists about science writing and the, and the overlap between the humanities and the sciences. And yet I have failed to attract their attention. So I'm wondering if there's ways that I could talk to them, approach them that might that that might pique their interest in writing. Are you referring to students uh, uh, in your class or faculty? Faculty, faculty. faculty yeah. I mean, when, and then the students in the classes. So we have a composition sequence uh, called writing for engineering. And the engineers take the cues, I believe, from the faculty. And they're good. I mean, they're good students. They're smart. You work there, you know. Sure, sure. But they're not, you know, they're, they, they're just really just not that interested in it, which is fair. But, but it's hard for us to have a conversation about um, how about explaining what you're doing both to other scientists and to non-scientists mm -hmm. if I can't engage faculty with uh, right. you know, like in the conversation. I, I agree. I understand. And thanks. I, I loved, by the way, being a CCNY. I learned so much about education and the kids there are amazing. I agree. Very different uh, style from Columbia students, but equally, uh, equally amazing. Uh, I, I think uh, I'm, my memory of, um, of faculty at City College uh, is, uh, is a group of fantastic people who try to navigate through a lot of work that needs to be done to help students who, who are in uh, uh, most of the time in uh, like having already jobs and taking multiple classes. Uh, first generation of immigrants from new countries like Nepal or uh, um, uh, India and other countries that I remember when I took my first class in uh, one uh, earth sciences, uh, in my class, there were something like 18 different languages spoken uh, for you know, 50 people. It was amazing. Um, but I do, uh, I, unfortunately, I do not have an answer to, to your question. And I think a part has to do with the, with the consolidated uh, monumental elephantiac culture of academia in many, in many areas. Uh, the engineers think that why would I need to write better because I'm still going to get my grants and build my, my things and uh, I, this is taking away time from me. Uh, the faculty, of course, they have to care about students. I think funding, it is, uh, or absence of cross-disciplinary funding, it is a, a source of, uh, of, uh, uh, of issues and I think also universities should start um, highlighting more extracurricular activity from humanities and science to actually give some practical uh, return to the students. I mean, why would somebody from engineering, engineering uh, who is brilliant and successful, want to spend a semester learning how to write uh, something that he might or she might never use? Uh, and so we, we have to go back, of course, to the reason why people go to academia. And now everything is becoming more and more channeled to produce human beings who can adapt themselves to their market job needs. Um, and uh, that's fair. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's not sending the right message to students, I think what you're saying. Uh, maybe uh, the way I the way I approach things in the past, um, when I was at NSF, the only way to do it is to who are the people that this faculty responds to? Well, the people that, that the university responds to. And so having a, I don't know, a, 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 what we did at NSF, I did a workshop and say, this is a workshop users, they're saying NSF has to do this and this, NSF cannot say no. Uh, I think I will start probably from the uh, cross-funding, uh, finding potential donors. And Thomas, I'm more than happy to uh, do anything can be done to incentivize these activities in any way there uh, with material or visiting virtually or in person. Uh, I, I do see this is a big challenge, and unfortunately, I don't have an, a straight answer. But unfortunately, some faculty they think that just because they have tenure, they can remain the same static box of knowledge that they used to be there, uh, and uh, that I think also is the source of problem. Um, I gave up my tenure at City College to become research professor at Lamont, 
Uh, and that tells you a lot about the way I was interpreting my career then. Um, so everybody was like, you're crazy, but I, I just know that that's what I want to do. And it's not just the fact that the tenure that is going to stop me to, to do the things, nor I want to sit down on my thoughts at 45 and live for 30 years or whatever I have to leave, uh, be doing the same things just because somebody gave me a tank. That was not my dream. Um, mm -hmm. My dream was to do science and to work with, with smart people and do something good for people. It seems really important that you're saying that doing writing is part of doing science and doing the kind of writing that you do is part of the way you do science. Yes. Um, I want us to have time for um, uh, a, a couple of more questions. I'll be short. Um, I see one from uh, Sue Mendelson. Sue, will you ask your question, please? Sure. Um, thanks, Professor Tedesco, for this conversation. I'm so um, interested in you talking about sort of finding a story and always wanting to tell a story with your writing. Because I think especially in scientific writing, people don't think about it that way, but I think it's really compelling to think about it that way. And I guess I'm wondering for you, as you work through data and research, what are you looking for to, to find the narrative or to find the story? Like, what are you mining for? How do you know when you've got the narrative? Um, sorry, my phone was ringing. Um, I'm looking, thank you, thank you, Sue, thanks. That's, uh, uh, I am very selfish uh, in the sense that I consider myself a non-expert in many things. I know I know a lot of stuff in Greenland. I know I know some stuff in Earth. But hey, when I read something about the ocean or ice, I don't, oh, oh, I know already that thing. What I look for really is me as a human being, as a sentient human being, not as a thinking, as a sentient, what I sense around me. What is that is the news moving my heart? And how do I connect that information to what is becoming my goal uh, over the next years and will be probably the goal for my rest of my career, which is basically to, uh, to work to better understand how socially vulnerable people and how people in general can handle the emotional and physical uh, implications of climate change. And so I, when I read a piece, I try to connect that how if I were a, a worker in Florida, if I were a, a, a bank employee in, uh, I don't know, in Galveston, Texas, or in Italy, what would really want to see there and to the simplify, and people think that, you know, simplifying things because of your scientists, oh no, that's, that's silly because actually simple things are very powerful. And so I try to take it to the bone to what would be the emotional message and I use myself try to strip myself down from all the things I know and say, this excites me because it made me think of these people or the thought of this couple in New Orleans of this old man carrying the woman. And then I connect the two dots. And again, humanizing that to me is, is extremely important because, um, because that's where, where it goes back to everything. Thank you for that answer. Um, we're, we are coming to the end of our time together. And so um, I just wanna notice that one of the things that you've emphasized over and over again is that you have given yourself permission and space to do different kinds of writing at different moments in your career. Um, and also that you work multimodally, that your way of engaging the world is through image and sound and words uh, and words that do very different kinds of work and how important that is. As a sort of last thought to leave especially the student writers in the room uh, with us today, what might you want to encourage them to do even if their track right now seems to be geared toward a very specific or, or uh, unitary kind of approach to writing, what's the what what would you like to tell them? Two things. The first one, I'm putting together a book of black and white photographs and poetry, so I will need any help from anybody. So if anybody is interested in joining the project, I'm, I'm here. Uh, and I need as much help as I can. But the, the real thing is, believe in what you write, um, expose yourself, because your feelings are, and my emotions is what's driving me. I mean, yeah, you can filter to the rational level, but Ultimately, if you are true, there will be people who will perceive that truth. And the violence that comes from others who don't see that 
is still a good tool that can be used to understand them and to understand the things that don't work. And there's always a breach that can be made through violence when you're a patient. And I think kindness and, uh, and, and openness are uh, incredibly powerful tools. So my, uh, my suggestion is write, write the same piece as you're writing to your uncle, as you're writing to your professor, as you're writing to yourself, to your lover, to your daughter, and then look what comes out that is really the central theme that you wanna, be, you wanna take emotionally and from a content point of view, and that's what really you want. And once you start looking into yourself in this way, more and more, the more you will do it, the more you will see right away the core of your thoughts and you will start focusing on the, on the things. And then being ashamed or be vulnerable will be still there because it's an important part, but it will be your companion. Like, you know, sometimes solitude can be your companion or other feelings. Uh, it's just a matter of not being afraid because this world is actually telling us that being vulnerable exposed is wrong, which is actually the opposite. Um, so that, that is my suggestion. Um, empathy and exposure, vulnerability and, uh, and all of these things are, uh, kindness are crucial and don't let anybody take them down. And uh, they're powerful, more powerful than violence. I can't think of a better thing to say at the end. So thank you so much everyone for attending, um, for participating in our conversation. And if you can unmute and we can give you proper applause. Thank you, thank you everyone.